Do you know your roots? In short, where you came from, your family history. What's in your past might surprise you. Don't switch your dial, or better yet, call a family member or friend and tell them to tune in. Rudy Daly with, will be chatting with this week's young academic achiever from Intermediate School 392, the school for the gifted and talented, and Asher Paul will have a special report on dealing with stress. Welcome to this edition of Brooklyn 45. How do you discover your family history when your ancestors had no last names and your grandfather or grandmother are either no longer around to tell you what they remember or they just don't know? How important is it to know your family history, your ancestry? My guest to discuss this is Sandra Tate Eady, a public historian, genealogist, and much, much more. You're going to tell us about this much, much more, but let us begin. What is the importance of knowing your genealogy? That's a really good question. So I usually come up with a few things. One um, that everybody might get tickled about is inheritance. You know, it's important to and know. you're not talking about money either. I am. I'm talking about money, <laughs> houses, cars, you name it. But um, more importantly, though, I think it's that legacy that you want to leave for your children. Mm -hmm. And as well, um, coming from the Caribbean, and we know that our island homes are in need of tourists, um, I am here to say to the diaspora, the Barbados diaspora, the Caribbean diaspora, come back home um, because you have family, you have people are there to welcome you. You said Caribbean. I went to one of your presentations and there were lots of people there from all over the Caribbean. Absolutely. What, yes. is, what has been their response to this? Amazing. I, I think that um, everybody in America is talking about ancestry. Mm -hmm. Every minute we see commercials on television and um, those people who live in the diaspora, who are born native born, oftentimes are able to have this conversation. And those of us who are m migrants or immigrants or descended from immigrants, we want to be able to have that conversation too. So I'm here to help people um, who are interested in that. And, and the response has been amazing. Earlier you mentioned about leaving a legacy. Mm -hmm. We hear certain ethnic groups mm -hmm. um, always talk about the importance of leaving a legacy. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we don't hear that from people of color. Now talk about the importance of that. Yes, well, I think that because a lot of our traditions have been oral tradition, um, that, you know, we believe somehow that we don't have a history or that our history isn't of value. Um, partly because, you know, most of us know that we come from enslaved people. And so we've been taught over the years that our history either doesn't have any value or that it's not discoverable. Um, but that's a myth. That's a myth. I want to know my legacy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm not talking about what we're going to leave behind, but right. I want to know where it came from. Right. How do I start? Well, good question. Um, you start with yourself. So you are Sam Tate, and then you work backwards. So you go from Sam Tate, your parents, your grandparents, great-grandparents, and one document should lead you to the, to the next. So if you have your baptism record, it should indicate who your parents are. And then you use that information to find out who their parents are, and so forth and so on. So we encourage you to start with yourself and just work backwards. It can't be that easy. <laughs> Well, it is actually that easy. Um, there are some gaps. You will find gaps. However, um, those gaps oftentimes can be filled with a little bit of research. Who do you go to? Now, you just said you start with your mother, you, your right, father, your right. grandmother, your grandfather. Right. And, but suppose well, they don't know or suppose it is very difficult for you to get that information well well I think I think it's worth a shot so if you could think back to growing up our our black families we're still storytellers and mm -hmm. they may not sit you down and say you know this is this is this is this but oftentimes you will overhear it in conversations they're having with other people family members visit mm -hmm. next thing you know they're calling names that you don't recognize but all of that is oftentimes family history that's being shared. Um, so I would encourage um, people to definitely start with oral tradition. Think back to those stories that you've been hearing over the years with names being called and place names being called. And you will realize that you have a lot of that information already stored in your memory banks and that your um, parents and grandparents have that information stored as well. So oral tradition, really important, I think, for black communities because that's where our tradition is, is in talking about these things. 
So I'll give you an example. My grandmother, she would stand at the sink and go, I like I can see my grandmother now looking over the half door with her long hair, da 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 da. Okay, so she's not necessarily talking to me and she's not necessarily saying, sit down, let me tell you about the family. Mm -hmm. She's just sharing a memory. Um, so you begin to document those memories and retain them and that becomes part of that family history that you're gonna one day fill. Talking about family history, a lot of people have been going to Ancestry.com. Correct. I actually got a package from them about two years ago, never did anything with it. Uh -huh. But um, you're not supposed to reprimand me now. But <laughs> tell me, um, where else do you go other than Ancestry.com? Right. Yes. Good question. Ancestry.com is actually a good resource. Lots of information, particularly when you were talking New York, Brooklyn, um, and the, the diaspora. Well, many of our ancestors came through Ellis Island, so those records are particularly helpful to getting us back to who are some of those family members in Barbados who were left behind. That information tends to appear in Ellis Island records. Ancestry is great for travel records. They're good, great for naturalization records, war records. A lot of our ancestors were here in the diaspora, so they would have been um, registered um, when World War, War, World War I came, even World War II, so there are documents there for that. So Ancestry is great. FamilySearch.org is where I primarily send people. That's a collection of records that were digitized by the Latter-day Saints, the Church of Latter-day Saints, and so those records are very instructive, and that site is free as of now. Mm. You do have to pay for Ancestry. Ancestry, there is a subscription, but I, I, I find that it's worth it to do the free trial and see mm -hmm. what you think. You've done so many seminars. Mm -hmm. Where else have you been outside of Brooklyn? Because I, I keep hearing <laughs> that you are in Brooklyn, you are in Brooklyn. Where well, else? I came to Brooklyn um, recently, and I've done work in Barbados. I've done work in Cuba. I've done work in... Um, Connecticut, where I'm from, and, um, you know, wherever the need is. So I'm, I'm expanding. That's where you do your research. So my research is primarily done for myself. I do it at mm -hmm. home, mostly on the computer. A lot of the d documents that we would need to fill out our family history can be found online. Suppose there are people who really don't want to know. Mm. How do you get the message to them that they should know? Interesting. Well, um, I think once, once, well, I would first try to figure out why don't you want to know? Mm -hmm. um, and people have a variety of reasons, particularly people who are sensitive about things like adoptions and, and um, that kind of thing. They may not be ready to know. Um, so I don't necessarily feel like my job is to get them to want to know. Mm -hmm. um, I present the information. Some people are intrigued by it. Some people want to know more and some don't. Um, eventually, though, I get everybody to embrace it because it really is exciting to know where you come from. You're a website author. <laughs> yes, um, I named it Bayesian Ancestry um, for now, but it's probably gonna that name's probably gonna change because I do have a nonprofit. It's called Baobab Genealogy Society, where I'm looking to embrace the diaspora, the African mm -hmm. diaspora, into the, this whole um, project. And what is this I'm hearing about some NBC series? Somebody whispered something about an NBC series that you were involved with? Well, yeah, um, I think because I have honed my skills in terms of being a researcher for, particularly for Barbados, um, I was recommended to do a research um, project for the NBC series, Who Do You Think You Are? Um, that's, they were profiling a celebrity who, may, who has roots in Barbados and they just need a little help with a roadblock that they had, yeah. Uh, before we close, how do people get in touch with you? Well, um, Bayesian Ancestry at gmail.com is a good place to get in touch with me or visit my website. Your Bayesian. website, yeah. of course. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra Tate Edie. I'm going to pull up my package <laughs> and, <laughs> and do something about it. Uh, coming up soon, Rudy Daly will be chatting with this week's young academic achiever from Intermediate School 392, the school for the gift and uh, the talent. The gifted and talented. Now over to Rudy Daly, who is sitting with this week's Young Academic Achiever. Rudy? Good, good evening. Good evening. And welcome to uh, Young Academic Achievers on Brooklyn 45. Thank you for having me. What's your name? My name is Jada Almonte. And where do you go to school, Jada? I go to ISC 92 for the gifted and talented. And who's your principal? Ms. Ingrid Joseph. Okay, so um, what grade are you in? 
I'm in the eighth grade. Okay, how old are you? I am 13 years old. When's your birthday? August 24th. Oh, you're Virgo. Right. Yes. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. So tell us a little bit about your school and what kind of classes you take. Well, my school is for the gifted and talented, and I take Algebra 1, I take ELA, I take Living Environment, um, Social Studies, just regular classes. Regular classes. Do you, it says gifted and talented. So I heard the gifted. What about the talented? What, 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 what are you So talents? talented, there's a program in my school called Broadway Junior. Who? and Broadway Junior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is a program that is for people that enjoy acting. Mm -hmm. And I do enjoy acting. So we do get certain Broadway plays that adults do, and we bring it into our school, and we reenact them. Okay, make sure that you invite me next time. Make sure, okay. Make sure Ms. Joseph invites me next time. Okay. So tell me, you, you listed all of those classes, all of those. Who's your favorite teacher? I would have to say Ms. Hurdle, my Algebra One teacher. Why? Math? Really? Okay. Yes. I do not enjoy math because I'm not really, I don't really understand math that well. Mm -hmm. And I feel like... Ms. Hurdle is a really good math teacher and she helps me move on and pushes me to the best of my ability. All right, shout out to Ms. Hurdle. All right, I'll make sure that Ms. Joseph knows that. Okay. So um, tell me about what, what are your future aspirations? What do you think about doing when you, get, when you get older? Well, I'm thinking about becoming a veterinarian. Okay, so you yeah. like animals? Yes. Which was your favorite? I would have to say a dog or a wolf. A dog or a wolf. Okay, tell me more about a wolf. It's kind of wild like, yes what about them so i feel like a wolf because it reminds me of my family so wolves they do hunt in packs mm -hmm. and my family is my pack so okay all right interesting do you have any pets now no okay so um have you thought about where you want to go to high school you see you're in eighth grade have you thought about where you want to go to high school what are you looking at tell me about some of your selections and why well, I'm not really sure where I want to go yet, but I am considering specialized high schools. Okay, so, you, so you, you, did you take the test yet? No, I'm taking it November 1st. You're taking it November 1st, okay. What's your number one school and what's the number one uh, school of choice? LaGuardia. LaGuardia for acting? No, for dance. For dance. You didn't tell me you dance, you told me you acted. Okay, so yeah. what kind of dancing do you do? Well, I do classical ballet and modern. Okay, they ever tell you that I can't, I don't know how to dance, I'm, I'm very bad at that. Um, so tell me some of the influences that make you want to be a veterinarian, make you want to be, you know, a dancer, actor, what are some of the influences? Well, when I was younger, um, my mom always told me to, always just allowed me to watch Animal Planet and, you know, Nat Geo Wild. So I kind of grew a love for animals while watching that, and I feel like, that's what interested me in, you know, in animals. being a vet. What yeah. about the dancing? Because you, 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 you chose, you, one of the, your number yeah. one choice is LaGuardia. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about that. So for dancing, I've been dancing since I was two years old. And I just enjoy it because I feel like when I dance, I feel free, but then I still have structure. Okay. So if, if the, when the road comes, Juilliard or Harvard? Not really sure. <laughs> Not really sure because it's a tough choice. I, yeah. I you did want to be a vet, so I just started to ask. Um, so tell me, how are you involved in the school? Tell me about your school life outside of the academics. What do you What do you do? I mean, you mentioned you did some plays and did some mm -hmm. acting. What else do you do? Well, I am in the student council, so I ran for treasurer and I won. And when I was involved with the student council, we did a lot of. Um, community services mm -hmm. so we did sock drives and a canned food drive and we basically gave back to the community okay so you like to the treasure you like to hold on to the money yeah okay awesome um when you're home tell me about what are some interesting things that you do besides i, I figured you read a lot so yeah. outside of reading and watching television, what do you do you know um well i enjoy drawing and sometimes i just watch youtube videos on how to do my hair let me see. So you did that yourself or did your mama help you? No, my mom. Your mom helped you? Yeah. Okay. So, um, and then 
on you, in your spare time, community-wise, do you, do, do you get out there? Do you, what do you do? Do you do anything like those? No, I don't do anything because I'm so engaged in dancing and then coming home and then studying, so. Okay. No. Um, so tell me, if, when you walk away from this, what is one thing that you'd, you'd want us to know about Jada Almonte? I want you guys to know that I am a hard worker. I am very dedicated to what I do. Mm -hmm. And I just strive for greatness. Okay. Have you looked at it? I mean, I know it's only eighth grade, but have you looked at yeah. any colleges as yet? Well, like I said, I do enjoy animals and I want to become a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking into Cornell. Cornell? Where's Cornell? Upstate, <laughs> I believe. Upstate, Ithaca? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a nice little place. Big red. Yeah. You, know, you, you know, you have not burgundy, but they're 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 red. Yeah. So you're gonna have to learn to start wearing red and <laughs> red and gray. Although yeah. Miss Miss Joseph wouldn't like that. She probably. Do you know yeah. Miss Mark? She's one of the teachers there. Yeah. How about Miss Rance Fisher? Do you know her? Yes, I do know Miss Rance Fisher. Okay. Awesome. So tell all of them you say hi and tell them that you made a you made a, a big hit. All right. Hi. And congratulations and and you know good luck. Thank Hopefully you. Hopefully you do get into the world, yeah. Yes. All I'm right. Afraid. Awesome. And thank you, and thank you, um, Jada, for joining us. Hi, I'm here, Ashab Hall, with Kenroy Crookshank, and he is a veteran. I'll have you introduce yourself. Just give us, a, like, your name, your age. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm Kenron Crookshank. I was a sergeant in the U.S. Army, stationed at Fort Trump, New York. I was in service for four and a half years. Okay, so I just want to like start this interview off by saying thank you for your service. It's my and pleasure. It's a very corny thing to say, <laughs> but or maybe I shouldn't say corny, but it's very like rehearsed and said a lot. But I think mm -hmm. it's easy to forget how how much our like freedom and liberty is like mm -hmm. due to the, your sacrifice. And I just really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart, genuinely. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I wanna like take it all the way back to day one of your <laughs> service. Mm -hmm. I wanna know like, where did the even the idea come from to go into the military? Like what was that? Where did that come from? Well, my entire life I've been around the military. My father served 35 years in the US Army. Wow. Um, he served in Vietnam. And he was a huge inspiration for me joining up and serving my country and giving back. Okay. Was it like an option or a discussion or was it just uh, like it this was, is what happened? It was completely an option. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I just always was intrigued by the military and what it does for this country. Mm. Okay. So when you're like, when it's time to go, you're saying goodbye to your family. What mm -hmm. are the thoughts going through your head? Like, what are you, where are you emotionally? At first, I was a little worried about like, you know, everyone worries like, oh, I'm gonna go to war, I'm gonna die and not see my family ever again. But I knew I was gonna come back. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make my father proud. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for the US military, I wouldn't be in this country right now. Right, right, okay. So those were like, that's what you were thinking. In what ways was the military like, were there any surprising elements to it? Like, oh, I wasn't expecting this or? There was some surprises, like basically just in basic training, you know, like crawling through the dirt while you have a live gunfire going over your head, um, just preparing for war for the possibility of dying. Um, but I expected a lot of it because yeah. I was around it most of my life. Right. But it was just like the reality of it is yeah. different than reading a handbook or hearing stories. Exactly. I, yes. that's, that makes a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. And so you talked about training, you referenced training. So I imagine they mention, mm -hmm. you know, that the fact that you're going into, when you're going overseas, you're going to be around civilians, people that live there. What is the conversation like? Like, what do they, how do they kind of frame it in order, like as far as interaction with civilians or like, how are you trained to treat them? We are uh, trained to be basically polite. We're guests in their country. We have to be politically correct and treat them like they're one of us. Right. Yeah. Okay. Does that kind of change over time? Like, mm. the longer you're there, is it like, do you get a little relaxed? Is it like a little? It changes over time, you know, based upon what country we're currently serving in. Um, sometimes, people don't want us to be there. Mm. So we have to stay in line most of the time. Like over time, like prime example, when I was in Germany, we were taught to behave a certain way, but you know, over time we relaxed and we had fun. 
but we always treated them fairly. Okay, okay. that sounds doable. <laughs> um, okay, so you mentioned Germany. Mm -hmm. Out of all of the places that are like, however many places you were sent overseas to, did you have like a preference like where you're like, oh, this is, I love this part mm -hmm. of Germany or I love this country? Germany and Latvia were my favorite spots. Okay. Um, basically the culture and I'm a big war buff. Mm. So Germany, basically World War II, the Nazis and America trying to liberate the Jews uh, was a big inspiration for me and like I'm really interested in history. So the food, the culture and the people and the history. Okay, that's good, mm -hmm. that's good. Um, so this is an interesting question. I'm just gonna throw, there's no like <laughs> easy transition for this question. But as a black soldier, did mm. you feel, notice, or hear any difference in treatment the way that like a black soldier would be spoken spoken to compared to a white soldier? In the military, we are not seen as blacks or whites. We're all seen as soldiers. Mm. But in a relaxed environment, you know, we're gonna have our little cliques, you know, the whites, the blacks, Hispanics, the Asians, Orientals. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, we're all soldiers. We treat each other fairly. Okay, that's mm -hmm. good to hear. Mm -hmm. It's like a very politically correct answer, and I respect it. I respect yes. it. Um, all right. All right. So when you are talking to prospective mm -hmm. soldiers, like that you meet um, another student and they're very interested in the military, mm -hmm. are there like personality traits that you can like pick up on through a conversation and be like, mm, you're probably not gonna do so well in the military or like? Yes, um, dealing with many soldiers from many walks of life, you could tell which soldiers or potential soldiers will be good to serve in their country. The things I look out for most is laziness mm. and selfishness. Okay. Because in the military as a soldier, it's all about teamwork yeah. and attention to detail. Yeah. So if you slip up on something, that could be someone's life. Mm. If you sleep in your barracks or over oversleep or something, you might miss, miss a movement, which could cost someone's life because that's one person that's not on a gun truck. That's right. one person that didn't check a part on a helicopter. So teamwork is the biggest part. So when I see someone's lazy and only care about themselves, I don't want them in. I mean, that's a lot of pressure and I feel mm -hmm. like anybody, any human being that pressure would weigh on them. Mm -hmm. Is there any conversation about like the importance of mental health while you're in the military or is it kind of like, is there any conversation around that? Yes, there's a big conversation about mental health in the military. Um, in the past, it was frowned upon to ask for help, mm -hmm. but now we have certain programs and resources available to soldiers for us to get mental help to talk to somebody. While you're overseas? While we're overseas and over here at home on, in our duty stations. Okay. Was there any strategy that you found particularly helpful that you would like share with another soldier that you're like, this is, this is the one? <laughs> um, basically for me, the biggest part for me is attention to detail. Mm. One slip up, it could be a huge mistake. You forget to tighten down a hose. You forget to clean your weapon. You don't want to be in battle and your weapons jams or you forget to clamp a hose properly and you spill fuel, environmental stuff. Yeah, yeah, okay. That is important. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're away from your family and your routine life, I mm -hmm. mean, I imagine that you're getting very close to these strangers at one point, yes. these are strangers. Mm -hmm. How quickly do you feel like camaraderie with the men that you're serving with? You feel it very quickly. Um, we have a program in the military called sponsorship. Okay. So once you complete your AIT, your basic training, and you report to your duty station, you are assigned a soldier that basically guides you through, the, as we call it, the real army mm. when you get to your duty station. They'll show you where to go, you know, the hangout spots, what to do, That's not amazing. to do. Yes. That's really cool, actually. Mm -hmm. I imagine that like makes all the difference. Yes. Um, well, I just thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it, and it's a you know, I think that what you do is very important and rare. And mm -hmm. so, thank you again. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, well, we're just gonna circle back to the questions <laughs> because this is very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, coming home, I feel like this is such a sensitive 
subject mm. and question. I'm going to try to phrase it very sensitively. But that transition period, I mean, do you have like an equal, um, like an equivalent of a soldier back home that you can speak to about like that transition and like mm. just getting accustomed to life at home again? Mm. Yes, the uh, transition back to civilian life can be very difficult, but we are provided with services from the VA and the VSO. Um, biggest thing is communication. We got to talk because a lot of veterans returning home, we become shuttered. Like we stay at home, we don't go out. Rightfully so, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I, me personally, I deal with it personally. Yeah. And I use my resources at the VA and talk to people. And like at our college, we have the uh, Veterans Dog Tags Club. So mm -hmm. just being around other vets, talking and being open can be very helpful. That's beautiful. I think that, that's literally important for anybody in any walks of any walk of life, but the military is such a, like a unique experience that mm. it's important that you guys stick together. Especially, I mean, you guys came home to a very interesting political climate, yes. and I think that I don't know. I imagine it plays a role. Like, if there's a soldier deploying right now mm. under Trump's administration, mm. does that add? Does that affect the energy or the? Yeah, does it affect the energy while you guys are overseas at all? It could affect our energy and motivation. But at the end of the day, we're soldiers. We're there to complete the mission and follow orders. Right. So we could have our personal views. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you're fighting for your country. Mm. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate having you today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Rudy. And to Asher, you can see this program again on our YouTube page, YouTube slash Brooklyn 45 TV. And you can also hear Sandra Tate Edy tell you how you can trace your ancestry. Yep, you may be in for a pleasant surprise. Visit our Instagram and Facebook pages, like us, and post your comments about this program. On behalf of our Brooklyn 45 team, I'm Sam Tate.